Well, folks, can I give you all a very warm welcome to Cumber Free Presbyterian Church for the services today. We're glad to see you all. We want to warmly welcome every single individual, both upstairs and down, to the house of God today. It's good to see Isaac and Hannah returned again from honeymoon, and we trust the Lord will continue to bless you. It was a good day that Thursday over in Money Slain, and we trust that uh, coming back again, the sun has been shining slightly, but there may be a change later on in the weather, but we're glad, glad to see you, and we trust God will richly bless you in your future life. So we're glad to see you all. We warmly welcome you in our Saviour's precious name. We're also glad that there are many tuning in online, and we've had great encouragement from you this past while at the Martyrs. Martyrs Memorial Easter Convention. We met quite a number of folks and uh, were able to chat to those who were listening in, have been blessed through the ministry. And we do appreciate that. And we trust the Lord will continue to encourage you and bless you as well. 419, uh, we're going to stand in a moment or so to sing. 419, it really is a prayer today that we can offer to God. Not only praise, but a prayer. And we want to think of the words, verse 1, May the mind of Christ my Saviour live in me from day to day. If you prayed that prayer every day, think of it. May the mind of Christ my Saviour live in me from day to day. May the word of God dwell richly. May the peace of God my Father rule my life in everything. May the love of Jesus fill me. May I run the race before me. May his beauty rest upon me. Let's sing it prayerfully as unto the Lord. Let's just unite our hearts together in the place of prayer, please. We'll seek the Lord's face and ask for God's blessing through the services already uh, have been conducted in the Sabbath school, Bible class, and also the morning and the evening times for preaching and for worship. I did learn last week of the passing of an uncle of Heather Allen and Barbara Colson, and just to extend on behalf of our church family, uh, our deepest Christian sympathy to you in the loss of your uncle Trevor. I understand he was living and residing in Australia, and we trust the Lord will comfort you and your family. I know you're still coping with bereavement, and now to have this added to you, but you've been in our thoughts and prayer since we heard the news on Tuesday night, and we trust the Lord will draw near and undertake for you. Uh, do remember, please, some individuals, if you could remember the, those that are sick and sorrowing. There's a vast list 
uh, before us today and we want just to pray much for these individuals. We're a church family and uh, when someone's not well then we want to be praying for them because someday you'll be standing in the need of prayer. We've often said this and it has happened. The next thing is your name is on the list and uh, you're the one we're focused on and it's good to be able to say that whenever you had health and strength you remembered others and we are a church family and we trust we'll keep that in mind and pray one for the other. You could remember Hartford and Phyllis Arnold today. It's the fourth anniversary of Matthew's passing and uh, they have lost family members this past while. Phyllis lost her brother and buried him not so long ago. She's lost some dear friends of recent that she fellowship with in the house of God, Eileen Sanderson and even Isaac Banks and many, many others. So please remember Hartford and Phyllis as well. Heather and Hard Capper have always got uh, that bereavement before them. Heather finds it extremely difficult to get over the loss of her son. Uh, King David was like that. We come in our preaching uh, to that scene whenever he lost Absalom. He penned the 61st Psalm. If you read that Psalm, and that's when it was penned on the occasion of the death of his son Absalom. He never got over the death of his son Absalom. Even though Absalom rebelled against him, he was a rebellious child. And uh, I think the, the, the weeping of David was that he felt Absalom was lost, for he says, oh, that, that I would have died instead of thee. Oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son, Absalom. And he believed that Absalom died in his sin and it broke his heart. And he penned the 61st Psalm, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Thou art a refuge for me. And we trust that these individuals will, like David, find refuge in the Lord. And we trust the Lord will continue to bless. We did receive a prayer request from... Heather Barnes, that's Stanley Barnes' daughter. Uh, she's not Heather Barnes now, but that's how we remembered her. Her uncle Derek is in South Korea and has taken seriously ill and is in hospital there and is extremely poor. And we trust the Lord will draw near to Derek and to the family. But she did send via our Facebook page a message for prayer uh, that the congregation would remember her uncle Derek in prayer. And we want to do that here today. Loving Father, we thank thee for thy presence. We thank thee, Lord, that we can gather as a people to worship God and to, Lord, approach unto thee, to give thee praise, to give thee glory, to give honour to thee. We come the living to praise thee. We recognise, Lord, that thou art God alone. Beside thee there is none else. Lord, if there was another God, then thou would have said, there are gods many. But Lord, thou who art the truth, thou who art omniscient, knowing all things, seeing all things, and therefore, Lord, who is all knowledge, nothing's hid from thee. Thou hast said, beside me, there is no God. And we believe thee, that thou art the true and the living God, the creator of the ends of the earth. And Lord, there could be no other God, because there will be no room for another God, because thou art a God who fills all things. Lord, you are inexhaustible in everything that you do and give to us. And we bow before thee today and we worship thee in the trinity of thy sacred persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We acknowledge thee as the triune Jehovah God of Israel, the creator of the ends of the earth, the one who formed us in Adam from the dust of the ground, breathed into him and us the breath of life, and we in and through him and procreation have become living souls. And we just lift our hearts to thee, that thou hast, Lord, created us. We are the work of thy hand. And Lord, thou hast put us upon planet earth. You put us on this earth for a reason. And we bless thee, we praise thee, Lord, that it has has been the divine will to create man and even in his fall Lord thou hast Lord plan of redemption to save a fallen lost mankind and you're calling out a people today you're building thy church Lord you're saving precious souls you're saving children and young people you're saving adults and those in senior life Lord those who perhaps on the early stages of life and those who are in the latter time of life we bless thee Lord thy mercy extends through the lifetime of the sinner and 
And we rejoice, Lord, you're gracious, you're merciful, you're propitious, Lord, and we acknowledge it. And we worship thee as our God, and we praise thee today. We just want to join with those across the earth. We just want our voices, Lord, here in Cumber. I want my voice, Lord, to blend with the voices of others as we lift an anthem of praise to thee, as we lift our heart and our soul to God, as we worship thee in the beauty of holiness, in spirit and according to truth, as we enter through the merits of the shed blood, the finished work, that righteousness of Christ that has now been given to our account. We stand complete in him, clean to the word he has spoken unto us. And Paul could say, writing to believers at Rome, there is therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And we desire, Lord, to live to please thee. We desire, Lord, to honor Christ who loved me and gave himself for me. We thank thee for the cross today. We bless thee for the one who came, who is God blessed forevermore and was veiled in human flesh who by virgin birth became a true man and lived as a man upon this earth the God man deity veiled in humanity we thank thee for the incarnate word we bless thee for Christ thine only begotten and well beloved son we thank thee for his sinless perfect life we bless thee father and thank thee today that he was willing to put himself into the hands of cruel and wicked men we think of how they plucked the very hair from off his his very face. We think of those crown of thorns that were placed on his brow and they took those reeds, those sticks and they beat those thorns into his brow. Lord, the excruciating pain, all that we would have felt if it was us was felt by Christ because he was a true human being. He became man by, by virgin birth and we bless thee for it that as a man representing us, all the marks, Lord, and the pain and agony of sin that could be inflicted on the human body was felt keenly and literally and truly by our blessed Saviour. And then they lacerated his back. They opened up his back. They made long their furrows. We think of how they took that whip and how they, Lord, laced it with lead and, and with iron and with sharp bone. And they wrapped it around his body and they pulled it away, ripping out the flesh and tearing through the muscle. Lord, what agony, what pain. And then they mocked him clothed him in scarlet and purple. Lord, bowed before him, put a reed in his hand as a scepter and a crown of thorns, a symbol of the curse of God upon sin on the earth, upon his lovely, spotless, sinless bride. And they bowed the knee and mocked him. And they blindfolded him and spat upon him. They slapped him with their hand and asked him if he was God who did it because you wouldn't need eyes to see. Lord, we think of how he was in control of all those things as we heard at the Easter Convention. And Lord, having suffered at the hands of cruel and wicked men, he was led outside the city wall of Jerusalem. And there he was crucified between two thieves, according to the prophecy of Isaiah. And there he was lifted up between heaven and earth, suspended between a holy God and a sinful fallen mankind. And Christ suffered the wrath of God when our sins were laid on his spotless, sinless body. He took my place and he died for me. He shed his precious blood. He gave his life a ransom for many. And we rejoice, our Father, that we celebrated once again, as we do every Lord's Day, the resurrection of Christ. We thank thee that the chief cornerstone, the great foundation of the Christian faith, the edifice, Lord, of the very faith that we believe, Lord, they realize the cornerstone is the resurrection of Christ. He is risen. He's alive forevermore. At thy right hand exalted, a prince and a saviour. One day he's coming back again. But until then, he is making intercession for us. He's pleading for us at the throne of grace. He's praying for me today that I would be pardoned and forgiven and cleansed and filled with the Spirit. That I would be protected and provided for, cared for, loved. That I would be, O oh God, directed in life and blessed richly. And all of these things come through the intercession and the mediatorial work of Christ. And we thank thee that is our Saviour today. And Lord, with many others, we join in a worship and praise and adoration of thee, our thrice holy God, through Christ, our Saviour and Mediator. We stand before thee, and in heaven we worship and give thee praise, the honour and all the glory, for thou alone art worthy. We don't want to leave this house as those who have come to worship but didn't worship. Our hearts and minds were elsewhere. We were, Lord, thy verted elsewhere.
over. We were distracted by other things. We don't want that. We pray, Lord, you'll focus us in upon thy word today and upon the worship of God. And we pray that Christ will be central. Lord, you're here already. We feel thy presence and we pray it'll intensify upon all of our hearts. Comfort that th today thy people. Build up thy church, save the lost, restore the backslidden, revive the church, lead us on with thyself, draw us closer to thee, we pray. Bless us through the word today, across our land, both inside and outside our denomination, those that are faithful to the blood of Christ and to the book of God. Grant that you lay liberally to the charge of every ambassador of the cross, and Lord, meet us at the point of need. Lord, thou knowest the heart today. There are those gathered, and who knows what burdens they're carrying, who knows what cross they're bearing, who knows Lord, their fear, their anxieties, their worries, Lord, their cares. But there's a God in heaven, thou God seest me. And even when Hagar was cast out and destitute, when she was despondent, lying under the tree with thoughts of despair, yet, Lord, thou didst draw near and came to her. And thou, she was able to say of that place, thou God seest me. And, Lord, you look upon us today, see us in our need, and meet that need, we pray. Give us grace sufficient. Give us help in time of trouble. Save us, O God, we pray, from despair and despondency. And may our faith be renewed. May our hearts be revived. May our souls be blessed. And we pray that thy name would be honoured and glorified. Remember, too, the sick and the sorrowing. We leave them with thee today. We pray, Lord, for the Allen and Colson family circles and the wider family and the loss of their uncle Trevor. We think, too, Lord, of Hartford and Phyllis Arnold today on this anniversary day of Matthew's passing. We think of Heather and Hard. We pray, too, for the Saunderson and the Banks family circles and the loss of Eileen, Lord, and Isaac. We pray too, Lord, for the touch upon Derek, Lord, uh, Mrs. Barnes, his brother-in-law. We commend, uh, Lord, this dear man and his wife in South Korea to thee and pray, Lord, being so far away, we thank thee, Lord, that in recent months he has come to know Christ as his own and personal saviour, but draw near and remember the need there. We just commit them all to thee. And Lord, bless too the uh, various meetings and missions that are planned this month. Pour out of thy spirit upon the preaching of Christ and may many be saved and brought to know the saviour. So continue with us now and Father, in answer to prayer, be pleased to glorify thy dear Son. Bless thy word to our hearts in Jesus' name, for we ask it for thine eternal glory. And the people of God said, Amen. Let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 5. We're going to continue in our studies in the life of David. There will be some natural breaks with other meetings and other things planned, but we'll try our best to get through this as quickly as we can. Uh, we are in first, or sorry, Second Samuel chapter five. We break in at the chapter at the verse six. We've already dealt with David coming to uh, Hebron to be king over, uh, I suppose, just the tribe of Judah and part of Benjamin, and then the other tribes coming to make him king. He now begins to shift his headquarters, his base of operations, his capital. Uh, to Jerusalem. This is where Jerusalem comes to the fore. Uh, Jerusalem, we know, is the most famous city in the world. Uh, there's not a city in the world uh, that is not unknown like Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a city known throughout the world. No matter where you go, individuals know of at least one city in the world, Jerusalem. It features in the Bible so much. It fe features in prophecy. And just as David came up to Jerusalem we, we're reading of here and he took it in the days of uh, Joshua they were meant to take the city of Jerusalem that was part of their inheritance in fact it was the inheritance of the tribe of Benjamin now why did I say that because Saul the last king of Israel was a Benjamite and he failed to take ground for the Lord such was his pursuing of David that he left the Jebusites in control of Jerusalem during the days of Joshua they didn't take that city. They didn't take that part of the land of Israel, the land of promise. Uh, in fact, the Benjamites, you know what they did? They got alongside the Jebusites. Rather than take control and destroy that nation of people as God commanded, they got alongside them. And they worked with them. And they settled among them. And they compromised. They compromised. Rather than taking ground and then holding that ground, they surrendered it. And the Benjamites failed, but it was Saul. He was king. 
He was head not only of the tribe of Benjamin, but the king of Israel, and he failed miserably. But David, he didn't. This is prophetic, by the way. David coming to take Jerusalem from the enemy will be the picture of Christ coming at the end of the age to take Jerusalem from the enemy. And Jerusalem will be eventually surrounded by her enemies. Uh, parts of Jerusalem are given over to the Muslim religion. There are areas that the Jews can hardly walk in, although they say we have control of Jerusalem. They can control the movement. But there are areas of Jerusalem that are 100% Muslim. But Christ is coming. Just as David came to Jerusalem, so the Lord will come to the Mount of Olives, uh, just below passing through the Kidron Valley. His feet will touch the Mount of Olives. That mountain will split in two, and he will sit as king in Jerusalem. And so we can see the prophetic picture here. The first act of David as being king, the first act was to take Jerusalem, to move his headquarters from Hebron to what is known as the city of David, David's, Israel's greatest son. In fact, if you look at the flag of Israel, it's called the Star of David. The flag of Israel, the Star of David. It's David's city. And David's greater son is Zion. It's the city of God. God is still a vested interest in Israel. God has a plan, an end time plan for the Jewish uh, nation. And he has brought them back again to the land. And he's still bringing them back. And that war in Hamas, by the way, that war uh, with, in Gaza has brought thousands, tens of thousands of Jews back to Israel. And they'll not be leaving. They'll not be leaving. Uh, because there are to be there present for the Lord's return. Uh, David's greater son will come to Jerusalem. And he will take out the enemy, just as David took out the Jebusites destroyed them. Oh, they mocked and they laughed. The Muslims believe that uh, because they have their graveyard at the eastern gate, uh, that the Lord will not return there because it's now a cemetery. It's an unclean place. Dead bodies are there. Uh, the eastern gate is all blocked up today. And the Muslims feel just as the devil would feel he could thwart the coming of the Lord. He can't. Just as David came to Jerusalem and he took it so easily. Yet for, for hundreds of years, there was failure. But when the right man's on the throne, then God blesses and God pours out his spirit. That's the context of our reading here today. Second Samuel, the chapter 5. We break into the chapter at the verse 6. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake to David unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, Thou shalt not come in hither. Thinking David cannot come in hither. But what I'll say there, by the way, uh, when it says, except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither. Thinking David cannot come in hither. Uh, what does that mean? What were they saying to David? Except you take away the lame and the blind, you can't come into this city. What, what does that mean? I'll tell you exactly what it means. They mocked David. If you have ever been to Jerusalem, and I haven't, but if you've ever been to Jerusalem, Jerusalem's on a hill. It's a tremendously fortified city. And in David's day, the Jebusites had fortified the walls. It was nearly impossible to take that city. It was called the castle. It was called a fort. It's actually called the stronghold Jerusalem. And it was well defended. And you know what these men did when they saw David coming? They mocked and they laughed. And here's what they says. David, we are so fortified that those that are blind in this city and those that are lame and can't walk, they could defend this city and you couldn't even take it. So except you defeat the blind and the lame, you'll never take this city. Because the blind could defend it. It is so impenetrable. You'd never conquer this city. And they mocked. And they laughed. Every attempt from the days of Joshua has failed miserably. Who do you think you are? King Saul was mightier than you, and he couldn't take it. The Benjamites, who are mighty in war, look what they've done. They've settled among us. They've realized you can't defeat us. Now, if we put the blind and the lame at the gates and on the walls, they could defend this city. It is so strong, 
So David, you've got to take away the blind and the lame before you could ever enter this city. And that's how strong they said it was. Look what it says in verse 7. Nevertheless, despite all that, all the history, all the defeat, all the failure, nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of, Jerusalem, or city of David. And David said on that day, Whosoever getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites and the lame and the blind, and he mocked them, that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief captain. Wherefore they said, The blind and the lame shall not come into this house. Now I do believe, and other commentators believe, that David and Joab never got on. Joab was a wicked man, a wicked, evil man. He was a murderer. But he was David's general and captain. And I believe what David was saying here, he wanted to get rid of Joab. And the easiest way would be to say, whoever takes the city of Jerusalem and leads my men in victory, he will be captain, more or less instead of Joab. But David got it wrong because Joab, if you read in Chronicles, Joab actually was the one that took the city. In fact, they took the city in a remarkable way. David says, if you get up to the gutter, now we know what a gutter is, but it's not the same. A gutter is a little trench that you have maybe in the field or uh, just that you would see a little brook that's like a gutter or even just a little hole that's been, a little channel that's filled with water and dirt and moss. It's a little gutter. But this is what is known as a waterway into the city of Jerusalem. And that's how they took the city. They didn't smash the walls down. They didn't scale the walls. They went through the waterway, they crawled through and they got through the tunnel and they got into Jerusalem that way and they took the city from the inside as opposed to the outside. It's a very wise move. Remember, the right man's on the throne now and blessing is in Israel. It's a remarkable passage, by the way. Verse 9, so David dwelt in the fort. See what it's called? The stronghold, the fort, and David took it. And they called, and called it the city of David. And David built around from Milo and inward. And David went on and grew great. And the Lord of hosts was with him. Amen. We'll end our reading there at verse 10, although we'll deal with some other uh, verses in the chapter. And we know the Lord will indeed bless the public reading of his own precious and infallible word. We're going to ask our clerk of session, Mr. Alistair, if he'll come forward, please. He's going to make some necessary announcements. Thank you. Can I add my words of welcome as well to all all right, worshiping with us this morning? It is good to see you. Uh, I don't really realize the number that are in until I get up here and see uh, the folks up in the gallery, and I see the gallery's pretty well filled this morning. Uh, so it is good to see uh, you all out uh, at the house of the Lord. Remember, of course, that our gospel service uh, this evening at 7 p.m., uh, and the soloist at that service will be our sister, Miss Charlotte Cahoy. Uh, then the meetings during the week, uh, Tuesday at 8, uh, the prayer meeting, uh, going ahead as usual. Uh, Friday, uh, remember, it's the, se uh, the seniors' meeting at 11.30, uh, and the speaker, as we mentioned last week, will be the Reverend David McMillan. Uh, do add your name to the list there in the hall of the church if you're going to be able to attend. Uh, that is for catering purposes. And of course, as normal, uh, you will uh, get a lunch afterwards. Uh, and I know that that's always very much enjoyed. Uh, so keep the seniors meeting in mind. Uh, Friday evening then at 8 p.m. Uh, is the Youth Fellowship. Uh, and at 10 p.m. the Men's Prayer Meeting. Next Lord's Day, the service is at the normal times of a quarter past ten for the Sunday School and Bible class. Uh, two services, half past eleven and seven p.m., uh, both preceded by a half hour of prayer. Uh, and uh, the Reverend Martin, God willing, will be with us next Lord's Day. Uh, then young adults, 
Of course, it will be the second Lord's Day of the month. That's the Young Adults Meeting for this particular area. The venue uh, this month is over in Newton Ards, the Newton Ards uh, congregation. Uh, and can I say as well to uh, our young adults within our own congregation, uh, just before you go head over to that meeting, not so far to travel this month, uh, but before you head off, uh, there will be a brief choir practice for uh, the folks from our, young, uh, our own Young Adults Fellowship. That's to get prepared for uh, taking part uh, in the uh, youth mission, which will be held here in our congregation uh, in the month of June. So remember that, uh, a first choir practice uh, to get ready to take part uh, in that uh, youth mission. Uh, then can I mention as well uh, that on Tuesday the 16th of April, this coming Tuesday week, it will be a deputation meeting and our brother Mr. Glenn Hamilton uh, will be along uh, for that meeting, so do keep that in mind. Then there's a special announcement to be made this morning as well. It'll take me a minute or two, but I apologize for that. Uh, but I just want to say to you that uh, at our uh, presbytery meeting uh, on Friday evening, uh, we were uh, given moderation uh, to add to our session here in Cumber uh, with the election of up to two new elders. So there will be a session and committee election taking place in the congregation here. Uh, the date of that will be Tuesday the 30th of April. Uh, so do keep that in mind, please. Uh, in relation to that, uh, there are, of uh, course, uh, procedures laid down by our presbytery uh, in relation to the organization and the conducting uh, of uh, session uh, elections. And I just want to run through uh, with you uh, the section from the Book of Church Order, which uh, sets out these procedures, uh, and read through that to you to just uh, put it all in context. Uh, the first one, uh, there are eight different th things set out. The first is, the date of the communicant members meeting must be announced. Well, I've just done that, so we've ticked that one off. It says the congregation uh, should be reminded of the qualifications of an elder. And of course, it is normal uh, before uh, session or committee elections take place, uh, for the minister to address that issue, and that will be addressed from the, the pulpit here on one of the forthcoming Lord's Day. Uh, they should be exhorted to make their choice a matter of earnest prayer. And that is very important, uh, that we should pray about this matter. Uh, and, uh, of course, it is the communicant members of our congregation uh, that are eligible to vote, uh, and you should be praying from now in, uh, to the Lord, that he would lead and guide and direct you in that matter. And then the final part of uh, this second point is canvassing is expressly forbidden. Well, I think you would know that anyway. I wouldn't expect uh, any of our brethren here to be going around uh, canvassing and saying, oh, vote for me. Uh, I wouldn't expect that at all. But it's wider than that, I, I think, as well. Uh, and just uh, our uh, communicant members should just be careful uh, not to seek to uh, influence others uh, to vote for any individual. It's uh, very easy to say, you know, I think so-and-so uh, would make a good elder and, and start to uh, say those things that might influence others. Uh, that uh, should definitely be avoided. Uh, and as individuals, we should simply uh, seek our counsel from the Lord on this matter. The third thing is that a list of all communicant members eligible to vote uh, must be posted on the notice board. Uh, and as you leave this morning, uh, there will be uh, on the table there a, a little notice board uh, set up uh, and you'll be able to look down. If you're a communicant member, do uh, just check and make sure that your name is on that list. Uh, it should be accurate and be pretty confident that it is, uh, but just in case any typing errors or anything like that, that someone uh, who is a communicant member wasn't on that list, please do check that 
uh, and if there's a problem, then let us know. Uh, then as well, a list of all eligible male communicant members must also be po po uh, posted on the notice board and alongside the uh, list of communicant members, uh, there will be a list of the eligible male uh, communicant members uh, who are available to be elected. Five, no one is to tamper with the posted lists. Uh, now, th this is just so that there used to be a practice before this was all set out uh, in black and white uh, that men would go along and say, well, uh, I'm not interested in being elected to either committee and would stroke their name off. Please don't do that. Uh, I'll read to you what, what you should do instead, but uh, no tampering with the posted lists. Uh, number six, men may only have their names withdrawn after speaking with the minister who shall consult with the session and revise the list. Uh, so uh, if you feel uh, that uh, your field of service uh, is other than on the committee or on the session uh, and you want your name removed, just mention that to the minister. Nobody will twist your arm or do anything like that, but we want this done in an orderly manner. Uh, and if you do that, uh, then we, w we can consider and adjust that list to take account of that. Uh, seven, we're getting uh, through it. Uh, the closing date for revising the list of candidates will be one week prior to the election. Uh, so the deadline for uh, speaking to the minister, having your name removed, will be Tuesday, the 23rd of April. That will be the deadline, and then that list will be final. Uh, and it says, therefore, on the final Lord's Day before the election, the complete list of candidates will be available for the congregation to inspect. So uh, in three weeks' time, that list will be final, and it will be the final list on which you will vote uh, come those elections. So uh, thank you for listening. Uh, do uh, make the matter uh, a matter of prayer, and we do pray that the Lord will lead and guide in this matter. Thank you. Will we just commit that election to the Lord in prayer, Father in heaven. We thank thee, Lord, that it is thy will that men govern in the church, whether in the temporal affairs as the deacon or committee men, or whether in the spiritual as members of the Kirk session. We thank thee, Lord, that hast set up church government, and thou hast, Lord, commanded the church to choose out men from among you and to place them in office to serve among the congregation not as lords of the flock, but examples to the flock. And we pray, Lord, for the extension of our session. We pray, Lord, that it will be pleasing to thee to single out from among this congregation two individuals that thou will place into office. We pray, Lord, for the re-election of our committee as well. And we pray, Lord, for harmony. We ask for unity. We pray, Lord, for acceptance of, Lord, thy divine will. We know that the lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. We realize, Lord, that there's a time when a man will be called to office. There's a time, Lord, that he waits, just as David did in the fugitive years. David was king. He was to be in that high office. But, Lord, you kept David waiting for some 20 years before you brought him in. And it may be that some feel, Lord, that they could be an elder in this church, and it may not be the time, Lord. It may be another time. Who knows? But we pray, Lord, you will make the choice, just as you did in the days of the apostles when they spread the matter before thee and said, Choose, Lord, which of these? So, Lord, we pray it will be divine choice that we will submit to it, uh, that you will increase us with men. We pray, Lord, there be no failure in electing men to office. We cry to thee for help from heaven and for a gracious move of thy spirit. Forward the work, we pray and grant, Lord, you will continue thy good hand upon us. We commit these weeks to the Lord and pray and that we will give ourselves fully to the Lord in prayer, seeking the mind of God, looking to the Lord. And we pray you will guide and direct and you will show to us thy divine will. So hear our prayer and bless us richly in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's turn to 482 before we come to God's word. 482, we're going to sing the first and the last verses, the first and last verses of 482, please.
Let's turn again in our Bibles to 2 Samuel in the chapter 5. And just with the word of God open before us, we will pray for help in the preaching and hearing of the word. Father in heaven, we do thank thee for this series in the life of David, for those things that thou hast opened up to us from thy word, even for the direction you have taken us in the study. Thank you for speaking to hearts, Lord. Thank you for blessing the word. And here we are again, standing as needy when we first began the series, begun that series. We pray now, Lord, you'll be with us. That you'll bless us richly. We pray, Lord, you will open our hearts and our minds and give help in the pew and in the pulpit. To this end, Father, forgive me for my sins today. Cleanse me afresh in the blood of Christ and give to me the anointing and the infilling of thy spirit. And Father, in answer now to prayer, do bless thy word, save the lost, restore the backslidden, revive the church. We ask it in Jesus' precious and peerless name. And the people of God said, Amen. David expanding the kingdom, or Christ expanding his kingdom, could be a title written over this fifth chapter of the book of 2 Samuel, the benefits and the blessings of having made David king over Israel were soon realized by the nation in a very substantial way. In fact, shortly after David was crowned king, he began to expand his kingdom. Not only did he take the uh, city of Jerusalem, uh, but he built Jerusalem. He expanded it. He also built his own house. He built uh, toward Milo. Uh, that's basically like if you were in Jerusalem, you might see the remains of David's palace. You might even see uh, the remains of those stones and those steps that, that made their way up to his palace. That what was known as Milo. Uh, David expanded that whole area and he expanded the city of Jerusalem and he made it his capital and he made it also not only the political capital but in chapter 6 of 2 Samuel he also sought to bring the ark of God into the city of Jerusalem into a tent that he had prepared for the ark of God the tabernacle remained at Gibeah and it remained there and the priests were there Zadok was there and I'm sure that David didn't want any friction between Abiathar and between Zadok because there was in the days of Saul that's who looked after after the tabernacle, it was Zadok, but Abiathar was with David in the hold and as a fugitive, and he didn't want any friction. Maybe that's why David only brought the ark and not the actual tabernacle to the city of Jerusalem. In the latter stages of David's life, he desired to rebuild the temple. God forbade him doing that because he was a man of war. In other words, his hands were dripping with blood, and it wasn't that David had taken out the enemy. He certainly did that, but David had innocent blood on his hands. And David had the blood of Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. David had the blood, do you remember that uh, campaign in the land of the Philistines where he wiped out men, women, and children? And we had David in the dock. We found him guilty. Well, some of us did anyway, of mass murder uh, and of uh, basically genocide. Uh, killing everybody so there was none left. And the Lord uh, wouldn't let David build the temple. But under the rule of King Saul, the kingdom was never expanded. In fact, it became in decline. It grew into a cesspool of immorality and anarchy. And it really didn't get any governance from a man who really was demented in his life. Even after the death of Saul, the land was still divided. It wasn't united. Some remained loyal to the house of Saul under his son Ishbosheth, and others basically just ran riot in the land. There was no king to truly govern. And during the days of Saul, the, the land was just left to the enemy. The Philistines might have come up here, there, and yonder. Uh, Saul sought one or two battles, but because he didn't deal with the Philistines, he paid the price. He paid the price for not dealing with the enemy in the kingdom. Because eventually the Philistines, as we have studied in the life of David, it was the Philistines that slew, that killed and slaughtered Saul and his three sons, and then brought them with shame to the wall of Bashan, and paraded their head and their bodies, and nailed them to that wall in an open shame, and brought the head of Saul into the very uh, godless temple, the heathen temples of Dagon and, and Baal and so on that they worshipped. And we know that Saul, because he compromised with the enemy in the land, the enemy eventually 
uh, destroyed Saul. It was the Philistines that he didn't deal with. It was the Philistines that conquered uh, Jerusalem. It was the Philistines that basically were allowed to stay in the land. It was the Philistines that were not subdued in the kingdom that eventually gr grouped together with others and they killed and they slew Saul and his sons. And we know uh, that David, he was a fugitive. Sadly, he was going to fight with those Philistines. So here's two men who were to be and one was the leader in Israel and yet both men were not in the place where they should have been with God and that's a lesson for us isn't it that if we're not in the place where we should be with God we will suffer defeat and if we compromise with the Philistine of sin if we compromise with worldliness and ungodliness, if we compromise with anything that's contrary to the law of God, if we allow the Philistine to reside in our heart and in our lives, that is, if we allow sin to go unchecked and uncensored and undealt with and unconfessed and unforgiven and unwashed, then that sin will destroy us. We have seen that so often in the work of God. We have seen it in our own lives in a measure, only for the mercy of God stepping in. But we have seen so many of God's people who did not deal with sin and temptation and they fell foul to the flesh and they didn't deal with it. We have seen those who are ministers and elders and those of the diaconate or committee men. We have seen communicant members of churches. We have seen individuals who have fallen because sin wasn't dealt with in their lives and they allowed it to stay. They, like the Benjamites, they, they compromised with it. They laid down alongside it. They worked with it. They permitted it to reside in their hearts and their lives and they didn't subdue the enemy. And as a result of that, that same enemy, that's the spiritual picture of this historical scene. That same enemy was the very means of destroying Saul, that which he permitted, that which he wouldn't deal with that which he knew was not of God and he allowed it to remain in the land was the very thing that destroyed him. There's a spiritual lesson there. But what a blessed change took place when the right man was on the throne. What a blessed change took place when Israel made David God's chosen man, king over the land and the nation of Israel. The book of Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 2 has this to say. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the righteous are in authority. We do not have righteous people in authority today. Our government and our parliament does not have the righteous in authority. That's why we mourn. For it tells us there we don't rejoice. It says when the wicked, the sinner, those that don't acknowledge God or beareth rule, the people mourn, they grieve. And it's true there are many, not just Christians, who are grieving and mourning today because of the, the laws that our government are passing in relation to abortion and now euthanasia. They're not content to destroy people when they're children in the womb but they don't want to tolerate our senior citizens or any person that's sick or suffering. And it's only the opening of the door. Oh, they will use the sentimentality. They will use the child in the womb that's not right. They will use the older person that's suffering and they will bring all these things in. But ultimately, as we have seen the legislation this past while, they want abortion up until full term. They want to kill and murder not far from this church, in the Ulster Hospital, the Ulster Hospital, one of the leading hospitals in abortion in this country. There's an individual who boasts on Facebook and on social media of the abortion she's carried out. That's in the Ulster Hospital, not far from where we are. They're murdering children. They're killing the unborn. It's a sad day because the fact is the wrong people are on the throne. And when, they, when the righteous are in authority, the people will rejoice. But when the wicked birth rule, the people mourn. And such heavy burdens they're putting on this country. We could go on, but I'm not going to. But you know, you could take this verse and you could apply it to this chapter spiritually and you could apply it to your heart now. When the right person 
is an authority on the throne of your life, you will rejoice. But when the wrong person, sin or self, bears the rule in your life, then you will mourn. You will be sorrowful. When the right person, Christ the King, rules in your heart and sits on the throne of your life, you will rejoice. But when sin or self is put onto the throne of your heart and bears rule in your life, then you will mourn and I will mourn and we will be sorrowful and painful and we will be miserable. And the lesson is clear here. When Saul was on the throne, the kingdom was in decline. The wrong person was on the throne. And when David was on the throne, the right person, the nation was expanded. The enemy was defeated. And great blessing was in the land. And there's a spiritual lesson here. I just wonder today who or what bears the rule in your life and mine. What's the governing force in your life right now? What's your motivation? What's your aim and goal in life? Who bears the rule over you? Who sits on the throne of my heart now? Who sits on the throne of your life now? Who have you crowned king in your heart, in your life? Well, if it's the wrong person, if it's not Christ the King, the Son of God, then the wrong person's on the throne. And your life, like the kingdom, will be in decline. How important it is to enthrone Christ today. We're not making him king. He is king. We're not making him Lord. He is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. We're just submitting to his rule. We don't believe theologically that you make Christ Lord or you make him king. In that sense, theologically, he's already that. You just submit to his rule and you crown him just as they did David as your king. And you submit to him and his rule in your life and mine as king of my life, as lord of my heart, as the one who governs and bears rule over me and the one that I pledge allegiance to and that I am loyal to. And when the right person's on the throne of your heart and your life, then there'll be great blessing. That's seen in the life of David when the right man came to the kingdom and to the throne of Israel. There was great unity and there was joy under the leadership of David. His son Solomon penned the words after his father had died. When the righteous or in authority, the people rejoice. Maybe he had seen or heard of all that happened in his father's life. And he thought of David when he penned those words. But I want to say to you, there was constant, and there was complete victory over the enemy during David's rule. David suffered no defeat. Remarkable, isn't it? He suffered no defeat. In fact, there was a going on with God in David's time. There was tremendous growth in the kingdom when David was crowned king over all Israel. But when the wrong person, Saul or sin or self, is on the throne of our hearts, there will be decline, there will be division, and there will be defeat. When self or sin reigns as king on the throne of your heart and mine, there'll be nothing but moral decline. Departure from Christ, defeat to the enemy, defeat, division in the church, disgrace before the world. And you can trace nearly every problem in the church to the wrong person sitting on the throne of the heart of those who are creating trouble. When Christ is king, you'll not create trouble in the church. When Christ is king, you will treat your wife and your children and you will treat your husband and your family the way you should and you'll treat your brother and your sister in Christ the way you should. When the right person, King Jesus, Christ the King is reigning over your heart and mind, there will be victory then. There will be growth and grace. There will be unity among believers. There will be expansion in your life. There will be the taking of ground and there will be the holding of ground. And not the giving up of ground. So this afternoon, I want you to consider with me David expanding the kingdom. Or literally Christ reigning on the throne of our hearts. That's how you could put that. But David expanding the kingdom. I want you to think first of all of his determination. Look what it says there in verses 6 and 7. 
a remarkable passage. We explained to you already what it means, and therefore I'm not going to do any more. But the king and his men went up to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land. And then look what it says. Nevertheless, verse 7, David took the stronghold of Zion, the same as the city of David. Remarkable, isn't it? One of the first acts of David was to literally take his army and lead them in victory against the Jebusites and to conquer Jerusalem. You see, Jerusalem has to be conquered. Jerusalem had to be kept in the land. It was in prophecy that the Lord would return to Zion and to Jerusalem, the holy city as we call it. And that's what it's known as in Scripture, although there's not much holy about Jerusalem at this present time. But I want to tell you, nevertheless, despite the difficulty, despite that it was a fort, that it was a castle, despite that it was called a stronghold, despite that they for years had held out against Joshua and the Israelites and one of the best fighting nations or tribes in the nation, which was the Benjamites, who were skilled with the left hand. The Benjamite was skilled with the left hand and they could literally take a sling and a stone and they could literally take out a little fly sitting on a plant. Such was their skill with, with the, the, the spear and the sword. And they were left-handed men. About 200 Benjamites would have been worth about 20,000 other men to David in the kingdom from other tribes. Yet those Benjamites couldn't take out the Jebusite. So they mocked and they laughed when David came. But David was determined, I'm king of Israel. I'm God's rightful man. I will take any place that God gives to me. And the Lord had given him Jerusalem. And so he says, nevertheless, despite all that's against me, I'm going to take ground for the Lord. I'm going to expand the kingdom. I'm going to have the kingdom grow. I'm not going to be like Saul and have it further in decline. I'm not going to feather my own nest and build my own palace and live in comfort. I'm going to take the entire land and I'm going to give it to the people. It belongs to them under God. Uh, Jerusalem was not an easy city to capture. As I said to you, they mocked. They says, David, we're all going now for a little feed. We're going to feast. We're not going to be worried about you. And then we're going to place on the city walls the blind. They'll not even know what way they're facing. And then the lame, they'll sit at the gates. We put them there. They can't even run away. He says, because we don't need anybody to defend this city. And you'll never take it. And if you want to take it, then you're going to have to take away the blind and the lame. They mocked. Because they're able to defend this city without us. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold, the stronghold of Zion. And he took the city of Jerusalem. It had remained in the control of the enemy for a long time. You know what is true because it's a spiritual picture here. David is a type of Christ. And the moment Christ saves the sinner, now listen to me, the moment Christ saves the sinner, he deals with their sin. I am not of those who today in evangelical circles who believe that sinners can hold on to their sin. There are people who are being counseled. They're looking for Christ as Savior. And they're told this, well, you know, I smoke. And I couldn't give the cigarettes up. And you know what they're told? They're told this, listen to me. They're said, well, don't you worry about the cigarettes. They'll go in time. Just you come to the Lord. Don't you worry about the alcohol. Just you come to the Lord. And maybe a few years down the line, God will give you victory. And if he doesn't, then he'll give you grace and he'll forgive you. I want to tell you, that's not the gospel of grace and of God. Now, I know that old habits die hard. I know that. I know that there are substances that are placed in the human body that were not placed in Bible times. I know that. I know that drugs were not available the way they are today. And the human body in the Bible times was not just as addicted to some of those things. But I'll tell you this, sin is sin is sin. And either the gospel deals with all sin or it deals with no sin. I'm convinced, and this it's true, when I meet a sinner, when the sinner wants to come to Christ and they tell me I'm on drugs or they tell me I'm an alcoholic or they tell me that I am a smoker and I couldn't give it up or I gamble 
and I just couldn't give it up, I said to them right away, God can give you victory right now. Right now. David took the stronghold of Zion the moment he was crowned king. And the moment a sinner saved by grace, I know old habits will die hard. I know that. God is able and willing to give you complete victory. Old habits die hard, but it doesn't take a long time. And I know my own father, when he was converted, he held on to those old cigarettes and wouldn't let them go. He got no counsel when he was converted that every sin must go and every sin must be conquered. That's why I believe there's a spiritual lesson here because I am convinced that when Christ reigns as king of your life in salvation, from the moment you're saved, you have victory over all sin. Drugs. Gone are the days. Would you not agree with me? Gone are the days when the smoker gets saved and takes the cigarettes and as we would have done years ago, you're not allowed to do it today, fired them out of the car window onto the street. There's a man present here today in this building and that's what he did with his cigarettes. He took them and he opened the car window and if I'm right, there were Benson and Hedges and he fired them over the hedges. <laughs> and he was done with them. We've heard of conversions of men. One I give an illustration of not so long ago. And he took the whiskey and he took all the alcohol and he poured it down the sink and he never took a drop of drink. But it seems now the gospel has been so weakened that sinners are permitted to hold on to their sin. And the Lord is so loving and so gracious. But I want to tell you, Christ suffered untold agony and sorrow and pain to deliver us from those things. And I don't believe the gospel is weak. I still believe, should I be the only one, and I'm not the only one in Ulster or Northern Ireland or the United Kingdom or the world, I still believe that God in the gospel through Christ, by the power of his Holy Spirit and the cleansing of the blood, can give instant, complete, and total deliverance and victory to sinners. And if I didn't believe that, then I might as well resign now from the pulpit. I might as well go into secular work uh, and do something else. If the gospel that I preach cannot do that, and it can, but we're contending today with individuals who've been told, just come to Christ and don't worry about those things. So what are they getting saved from? What are they getting saved from? What are they being delivered from? And then people see them and they say, well, he's supposed to get saved and, and he's drinking. I saw him there and he's drunk and he's supposed to be saved and he's smoking. And from he has got saved, it seems his life's going down, but he's going to heaven. God loves him. I want to tell you, the Lord loves sinners, but he doesn't love our sin. He doesn't tolerate our sin. He doesn't compromise like the Benjamites with sin. He doesn't lie down beside it. He doesn't accept it. He's not like the Israelites who for years cannot defeat the Jebusite sin. But when Christ, David, is on the throne. There will be victory. Complete victory. There's some people say, you know, I've been saved for years and have never mastered my temper. Why not? Why haven't you mastered your temper? That's an excuse. That is an excuse for a bad temper. No Christian should ever have a fierce temper. Now, people have a short fuse, but I'll tell you this. I can tell you now. You will have a bad temper if you're not walking with God. If you're not living under the shadow of the cross, if you're not close to Christ, you'll have a fierce temper. You'll be cold at heart and backslidden. One of the signs that I know that I'm not walking close to the Lord is that I become irritable and slightly intolerant of things around me. 
It's a sure indication to me, Thomas, you need to get alone with God. You're not right. The way you're thinking, the way you're reacting, maybe even the things you have said, your attitude, your sharpness, it ought to go. It has to go. The fleshly desire, the strong temptations must be overcome. That's right. We're living in a pornographic age. Our young people on their phones, nobody knows what they're watching. Nobody knows what is brought up. And I want to tell you something. You can go on the websites, it's happened to us all. And you're searching for some item of clothing. And you find this shop and you go on to it and it's a pornographic website. Now you can put your filters on. But they can circumvent them. And children from their 10 until they're 16 are exposed now to a pornographic age either on television or through the internet it's a dangerous world we're living in I want to tell you something there's no excuse for sin like that in a believer's life none and if you say I can't overcome it it's not you can't it's you won't every Jerusalem can be conquered David shows us that we're living like Saul if we don't conquer Jerusalem and capture it for the Lord and take ground. So there was determination, an unforgiving spirit, unbelief, covetousness, some besetting sin, bigotry. What about bigotry? Well, we often talk about the sectarianism of others. Have you ever checked your own heart, how you feel about other religions or other people or the Roman Catholic Church? We could be full of sectarianism and bigotry and bitterness if we really searched our hearts, but all those things must go. I know people would have said, you know, I, you know, I was a real loyalist before I got saved and I, it must just be me because I don't like such and such and I hate this. I want to tell you something. That's a few people with a smiling here. Maybe you like that. But it's so easy just to get involved in all that culture. All that culture. And I want to tell you, 90% of that culture is based on bigotry. And there's a sectarian spirit there. And we've seen it manifest in football stadiums, in our own country here. We've seen it manifest. And yet there are people who say, well, I just a throwback to my old days, you know, and I just never really get over it. I want to tell you, that's an excuse. That's an excuse. Every Jerusalem can be conquered. David shows us that. His determination. I want you to think very quickly, secondly, of his progression. Look what it says in verse 10. I like, I like this little verse. I was looking at it. I thought to myself, that's the key. To David's life. And David went on. David went on. Now listen. If I was to preach nothing else. And you said to me. Well I hope you'd stop now. If I was to preach nothing else in this meeting. If this is the only verse you got going out of this house. I'll tell you. You have got a choice morsel. You have got meat to chew upon. To feed upon. To bless your soul. And David went on. That's a beautiful statement. How are we with the Lord? Going on with God. Isn't it a beautiful thing? It's lovely to see people saved. It's lovely to see people restored to the Lord. It's lovely this past while to hear of individuals who have been converted, whether young or old, and I've heard they're going on with God. I've heard they're out at church. Wow. Uh, They're out at the youth meetings. They're here, there, and yonder. They're doing this. They're doing that. They're reading their Bible, you know. It's wonderful. And we rejoice in it. We say, praise the Lord. Is it good? I like to see the new convert go on with God. And there's a man and a girl. There's a woman there. And they've been restored to their first love again. They've been backslidden for years. And now look at them. They're out at the meetings. They're at the prayer meeting. They're out in the open air. Is it wonderful? And they never missed a meeting during the Easter convention. Isn't it powerful? It's tremendous to see them go on with God. God. But here's the question. What about me? What about me? Lord, what about me? Am I going on with God? Am I walking with thee, Lord? I'm asking, Lord, the question, am I going on with you? Am I walking with God? Can it be said, could the Holy Ghost now write of me as it was written of David, Lord? And Thomas Martin went on. But it says more than that. Look what it says in verse 10, his progression. David went on and grew great. And here's the reason. For the Lord God of hosts was with him. That's not just Jehovah Sabaoth, but it's Elohim in there, the mighty power. So you could read this like this. Because Jehovah, Elohim, Sabaoth. 
Jehovah, the faithful keeping God, was with him. Elohim, the mighty God, was with him. And the captain of the hosts of the Lord was alongside him, fighting his battles, giving him victory. For that's the title here of Christ, the captain of our salvation. He is Jehovah, Elohim, Sabaoth. Not Sabbath, Sabaoth, of hosts. That's the hosts of heaven. He's the captain. He's the, the general who leads the hosts of heaven in the battle against our enemies. You're not left alone. The Lord's with you, just as he with, was with David. And when the Lord's with you, and he's there as the captain of your salvation and king of your heart and of your life, then David went on. You'll go on. And you'll grow great. It's wonderful to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Christ. And we know that new converts, that's what happens to them. They grow. They gain more knowledge. But here's the question. Maybe you've been saved for 40 years. Maybe you've been saved from a child. Have you grown in knowledge? I know we hear people today and they say this to me. And listen, I can understand it in a measure, but again, I just feel there's an excuse there. They say, you know, I just can't memorize verses from the Bible. Wow. Wow. They know everything about a car and the engine. They know everything about a tractor and farm machinery. They know everything there is to know in the office about rules and regulations. And they may be able to quote if they're a manager or manageress. Do you know that rule 7, paragraph 3, section 4 says? Wow. What about John 3, verse says? It's so easy to memorize other things, but when it comes to the Bible, well, let's make an excuse. That's not growth and grace. We need to immerse ourselves in this word. Would it not be a good practice for us all, for this preacher included, to learn a new verse every week? Wow, I, I, I'm letting you off there and I'm letting myself off the hook. If we were to learn a new verse every week, I would even take it if you only learn one new verse every month memorized it just pick out a promise memorize it close the book as if you're in the children's meeting and say right we'll switch the screen off we'll cover over the words and let's say the verse together you don't have to say after two by the way and memorize just one in a month that'll be 12 new verses in a year once a week wow it will be 52 verses 52 in a year New verses, new promises that you can plead in prayer, that you can quote to other people, that you can use in evangelism, that you can put in a card, that you could even encourage your own heart with. You see the progression? Not only was there determination and progression, but notice the opposition in verse 17. Look what it says in verse 17. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it, and he went down to the hold. David had learned from past experiences. It's just don't rush into these things. Take your time. Seek the Lord's face. Ask counsel from God. That's what we need to do for this election of the elders. And God willing, under those rules, as you heard today, uh, by a rule of presidency, I must preach on the eldership at least and maybe cover both of those in my messages. So in the next four weeks, maybe in the next two weeks or so, I will be dealing with that subject and we'll take a break from the life of David. But I will say this, the moment David was on the throne, the enemy came. And I want to tell you, if you get serious about God, the devil will come against you. And if you get serious about prayer, the devil will come against you. And I know God has been blessing in this congregation. God has been blessing. If you were at the annual meeting, you'd have heard the annual report of the blessing of God in this house. And even since that, God has still been blessing. But I want to tell you something. When the Philistines heard, when the devil got wind of what God has been doing, when God is working in a congregation or in an individual's life, you can be sure the Philistines will gather. You can be sure the enemy will be at the door. You can be sure you will get opposition. And I want to tell you something. Am I preaching to you? No. I've already preached this to myself. I've already practiced this in recent days. I can't tell you what happened. I can't tell you what came my way. I can't tell you. I wouldn't even tell my session. 
I can't tell you what I went through physically, mentally and spiritually in the last few uh, weeks or so. I can't tell you. But all I can tell you is this. I know the very spot. I could bring you to it now. There, at that very place when the devil attacked me. And I can tell you at that precise moment what I did. And I determined that I would be going through with God. No matter what happened. No matter what comes my way. No matter what falls apart in my life. I'm going through with God. Let the devil do what he will. He's in the Lord's hand anyway. But as for me and my house. We'll serve the Lord. We're going on with God. And even though there's opposition. And even though there's resistance. There's hindering. And there's satanic powers at work. And even though the devil may set his entourage and his armies around my heart and my home and my house and this church and other things. I want to tell you something. God being my witness, he was there. He was there when in my heart I told him, I'm going on with God. I'm going through with God. I'm going to break through. But that's exactly what happened here. And I know time has beaten me here as it usually does. But I, I want you to, to see something in verse 20. This is very important. And David came to Baal Perazim. Now David gave it the name. We don't know where this place really was. We just know that it was somewhere in the valley of Rephaim. Where the Philistines gathered. And it says, David smote them there. And said, the Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me. As a breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of that place. Baal Perazim. Now what does that mean? Baal. Is this a false god? No. The word Baal literally means master. Anytime you see Baal in scripture. I know there's a false god called that. Baal. You ever heard the film? And you've seen it. Lord of the flies. That's Baal in the Old Testament. He was master of the flies. Master of that which is filthy. That's why his religion was sensual and fleshly and corrupt and vile. He was Lord of that which was filth. That's what it means, Lord of filth. Lord of dirt. Master of corruption. But the word Baal in itself in its purest form means master. And Perizim means breakthrough. To breach. And here's what David said when the Lord gave him victory. He called the place Baal. Perizim. In other words he says. Here is the Lord of breakthroughs. Now do you need a breakthrough? A breakthrough in your family? I do. Do you need a breakthrough? With individuals in your family that are not saved. That have never come to Christ. I want to tell you he's the Lord of breakthroughs. That's what that term means, Lord of breakthroughs, master of breakthroughs. We often talk, we need a break in the meeting. We need a break in the mission. Oh, that God would break through, encumber and save and move and work. Oh, that God would break through in our Sabbath school and he'd bring more boys and girls out in our youth, in our children's meetings, in the, all the meetings of the church, in their evangelism, in our gospel campaigning. Oh, that there would be a breakthrough from God. I want to tell you who he is. He's the master. He's the Lord of breakthroughs. Do you need a problem broke through? Do you need the Lord to intervene and break through that problem and deal with it? He's the master of it. He's the Lord of it. His determination, progression, his opposition, and finally his supplication. When the enemy came, David said, Lord, shall I go up? And will you give me victory? And the Lord said, go up. David inquired of the Lord when they came the second time. He supplicated the Lord and he said, shall I go up? And the Lord says, no. You'll not go up as a direct approach this time. But you will hide yourself among the mulberry trees. And when thou hearest a going in the mulberry trees, then thou shalt bestir thyself, for the Lord goeth before thee. And you know, congregation, church of Christ, brethren and sisters in the Lord, it's good to wait on the Lord among the mulberry trees, to wait in the place of prayer. And then when you feel it's God's time, then God stirs your heart. There's a going. A little rustling in the trees. The evening breeze comes. 
And that's the indication. Stir thyself. Get up and work for Christ because the Lord of hosts goeth before you. Father, do bless the word to our hearts today. And we pray, Lord, that you will encourage us. We've labored long and hard in the word. And we pray you'll back at home and you'll bless it and burn it into all our hearts. Speak to us today. Build us up, Lord. Help us to take every Jerusalem, defeat every Philistine, and help us to have David, King Jesus, Christ the King, as Lord in our lives. Break through, we pray, in Jesus' precious and worthy name. Amen. Thank you.